Hello and welcome to Scratch That Itch, where curiosity makes us stick. We're back again with yet another episode. And today we're here to talk about something that has impacted each and every one of us here. We're here to talk about the educational system. And to talk about this, we have with us a visionary, an author, and someone who's passionately reinventing schools at the moment, the founder of The Circle, Sandeep. Hi, Sandeep. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, before we actually jump into today's episode, I've heard some revolutionary stories of your work in the social sector and the educational system. So could you please help us with your journey in this sector with TFI and how did Circle come around to be? Yeah, of course. I was born and raised in the U.S. Um, and I was actually on a path to, to going to, to medical school. And I was in college, grew up in the southern part of the U.S. And I was actually a couple of months away from graduating. And I, I had a bit of an epiphany, um, something my parents to this day would probably tell you was actually was a breakdown and not an epiphany. But And that was that I was just doing it for all of the wrong reasons, right? Like I was going into... I was going in this line of medicine because like, I thought it would give me security. I thought it would give me, you know, a, a pathway filled with like, with, with security. And I just recognized that that was not like the reason that I really wanted to be choosing a career for. I sat back and I asked myself, like, if I really wanted to change the way that things worked, like what was the best way I could do that? And that landed me up in a classroom in Washington, DC, actually, where I taught seventh and eighth grade science for two years. Um, in an inner city government school, right? And to give you a sense of like what this school was like, there are 238 schools in the District of Columbia, right? So 238 schools in DC. And our school was actually ranked 238 on 238 on academics and 237 on 238 on safety, right? And I remember picking up a major newspaper one day, and it actually said, this school, which I'm not gonna name it, said, robs kids of the education they need and deserve, right? And I remember like being shocked as I looked at that headline and I, I started to look through it and I started to read through it. And like, it actually went on to list out these statistics, right? And it basically said like, you know, four out of 10 kids will graduate two out of 10 kids will make it to college and one out of 10 kids will actually graduate from college. And I remember going into my classroom after reading that and looking around at my classroom and the 35 boys that I was looking at and thinking like, I wonder which one out of 10 or which three out of 35 will actually make it. Those two years would be probably the toughest two years of my life. But those two years also taught me a bunch. Like they taught me one that like poverty is so very real and the impact that it has on kids is just catastrophic. But they also taught me that it's solvable. Education has the power to actually be game changing for kids from under-resourced backgrounds. And I left those two years thinking like that was one of the greatest levelers that we could actually pull. And I think I left those two years convinced that I would probably spend a lifetime doing this work. And a lot of people today, including family members back home, still ask me, like, why have you stayed in India? You went from one year, then you went to five years, then you went from five years to 14, then you went to foreseeable futures. And now you're telling us it's probably going to be a lifetime. And I think what, like, got me here is the same thing that keeps me here. And those numbers, like, they're just mind-boggling, right? 500 million below the age of 25, 360 million below the age of 18, and yet 70% are dropping out by their tap into the potential of these 360 million young people and you could unlock decades of growth for, for the country or we could go on the path that we're currently on and that could just be catastrophic for the lives of hundreds of millions. I want to uh, go back to the beginning of the story that you were talking about. You know, uh, you spoke of these numbers of even dropouts as you were experiencing. So I want to know, you know, were you able to make any sort of connections? Because usually the minute you get kids who are not scoring that well, you just assume that they're not interested or, you know, they don't want to do it. So was there, what was the connection between their circumstances and how well they were performing in school? Like right now, 
the prevailing belief across the country is basically that like poverty equals destiny, right? Like that is the prevailing belief. Where you come from will dictate where you go. Where you were born will dictate where you go. The income level that you were born into will dictate where you go. And truthfully, like schools were designed not to fundamentally shift that. That's just like a fundamental flaw in how we thought about and conceptualized schools and like the purpose of schools. And yet at the same time, like when we think about the kids that we've served over these last 14 years, which have been tens of thousands within our direct control, like what we have discovered is that like that equation that poverty has to equal destiny just doesn't make any sense, right? Like kids have like the potential to be able to climb out of that, but what they need are a couple of big things. One is they need strong teaching. Like the impact of a strong teacher, it is by far like what we have discovered and what the research says that far precedes our interventions. Like the impact of a strong teacher actually far outweighs anything else. And two is they need excellent schools. Like they need schools that are actually committed and surrounding them with an environment that helps strong teachers flourish and that helps kids flourish. Now, I think you rightly mentioned the purpose of school as well. So what do you think really is a purpose of a school? Why do schools even really exist? I think I have long believed that like schools have to play a role in being able to basically shift the opportunity levels of kids to be able to basically help kids that are coming from under-resourced backgrounds climb out of poverty. And I think I still believe that that is a fundamental role that they have to play. Um, I think I do believe now that like a couple of things are adding to that. One is I think I believe that for schools to be able to live into that promise, schools need to be preparing kids for the future and not today. The second is that like, Schools have to be preparing kids to be able to create a better world. We are witnessing a world that feels broken pretty much by every single day that we observe, right? Pick an issue, pick religion, pick caste, pick race, pick gender, right? Like pick an issue. And at the heart of it, if you were to reduce that issue to basically like its most reductivist equation possible, like what you would end up with is like, we have a breakdown in how people treat one another. And so the question is, when you have a breakdown, that's your common denominator across so many of our biggest issues, like how do you solve for it? And that's where I think the purpose of school and saying like, can schools play a big role in teaching kids how to create a better world? Can schools play a role in equipping kids to envision a new social contract that's already broken? We've spoken a little also about, you know, uh, the mismatch reality, which is right now we're not even looking at shifting opportunities. It is just enabling uh, people to be where they are and sort of go ahead from there. So what are some stories or some incidences in your life that have validated this or that impacted you enough to be able to act on it? Gallup, the organizational survey, right? They, they survey organizations across the world and they do this survey every single year, excuse me, where they basically ask employers across the world, they say, what, is the, what are the top three skills that graduates seem to be leading with, right? And employers have been answering this question since 1960, right? Close to 62 years, employers have been answering this exact same question. And in 1970, 52 years ago, guess what employers said were the top three skills that graduates needed to have? Communication, I'm assuming, motivation, and I don't know, I'm lost at the third one. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Oh, oh wow. And if you go back to the world that existed then, like that made a lot of sense, right? Fast forward 52 years, 2022, and guess what employers answered on that survey most recently? Yeah, I think I'm going to repeat my answer because I genuinely think communication would be one. Uh, critical thinking, I'm assuming, is definitely one. And uh, collaboration or creativity? Close. So complex problem solving, the ability to solve complex problems. Cognitive empathy, which they actually believe is a precursor to collaboration and teamwork. And the third is basically creativity. So the abilities to be able to create from scratch. 
And underlying that, of course, is basically evidence that the workforce has changed. Yet schools are stuck in the past, right? Like schools, when you go into most schools, like they're preparing kids for a 1970s world, right? Like most schools that you go into are still focused on reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now, I'm not saying that reading, writing, and arithmetic aren't very, very important for kids, but like what companies require and what it's going to take to be able to solve the world's biggest problem is going to require us to go much, much deeper and much further than reading, writing, and arithmetic. And so that's like, I think that realization at looking at like how much the workforce has changed, but simultaneously looking at the fact that schools have pretty much stayed static is probably the biggest thing that's actually driving this, right? I'll tell you two stories. We had a child about seven or eight years ago that got into an argument with her mother and they're at home and they get in this big argument and you know, her mother slaps her and her mother walks out the door. And after that, like she basically got so angry at she doused herself in gasoline and she lit a match and she ended up passing away. We got a call that evening and, you know, we're like, look like one of our kids is actually like made to the hospital. And like, we didn't know what was going on. We rushed to the hospital. And by the time we got there, like she had already passed away. And I remember thinking after that, that like, oh, there's so many forces that are at play for our kids. And like our schools cannot just be like limited boxes that are confined just to being able to provide kids one type of service. like. To help kids succeed, kids need a continuum, a circle of support that surrounds them with a whole holistic range of things to be able to help them get through and battle all the crazy things that life throws at them. As I was writing this book, Grace Sunshine, that I wrote a couple of years ago, I was actually spending time in Gulbandi. And Gulbandi is one of Bombay's largest slums, right? It's actually one of India's largest slums. So I was in there and I was actually talking to some kids and I kept asking some of the Teach for India fellows, like, who do you think I should talk to? Like, give me some kids that I could actually spend time with. And, and they kept pointing me to this child named Mahek. And I started sitting down with Mahek and they were like, you're just gonna love spending time with her because she's such like an incredible kid. And as soon as you meet Mac, you can actually tell why, like she's like got this vivacious smile and you find out like that, you know, her favorite like movie is Finding Nemo and she loves reading Harry Potter. And she's just like, has this life about her that puts you at ease when you're talking to her, right? And we start talking and I soon start to discover that she's multiple years behind where she needs to be, right? Like she is multiple, multiple years behind where she needs to be. And I started to wonder why I'm like, you've got this child that's so inquisitive that like has something that's more like, what is it that has her behind? And, and after about an hour of chatting, she's like, hey, would you want to come meet my mom? So I'm like, yeah, sure. And so we start work, we start walking through Govani, we start walking through the, the alleys of Govani, right? And the way that the community is set up is the closer you live to the trash dump, the cheaper your rent is. Right? And the farther away you live from the trash dump, the more you'll pay. And that's because in the summers, the actual, the trash, it gets so hot in the city that the trash combust, the methane starts to rise and the ash of the trash actually starts to drop on the residents' homes, right? And the closer you are, the more of that debris you're actually subjected to. And we keep walking and we keep walking and Mehek's house is actually 200 meters away from this dump, right? And she lives in this like tin shed that basically sits on the, the periphery of this dump. And I walk in there and her mom's just come back from work. She's actually taken an hour off to be with us because my head called her. And, you know, her mom cuts cardboard boxes for a living. Her dad's a rag picker and couldn't make it. Um, and he was actually in the dumping ground that day. And we start talking and, and, you know, we get into a little bit of conversation, but it's a little bit awkward. And and she looks at me and she says, you know, like these teachers, these Teach for India fellows, they keep coming to the house and they keep talking to us about college. 
And they keep telling us that like Mehek is one day going to go to college. We know she's going to go to college. You want her to go to college. And she says, you know, like part of me wants to believe them, but part of me, a large part of me just thinks that like, it's just a joke. And so why would you think that? Like, why would you actually believe that? And she said, you know, if you knew what we've been through, if you actually would have seen the places we lived before we got here, then this house, which I know you have to be judging right now, you would actually realize that this house is actually a blessing for us. You would realize that everything that we have is a blessing. And she said, look, like I wake up every single morning and I do one thing and her voice gets kind of quiet. And she says, we wake up every single morning and we pray for a blessing. And she said, because that's all that's going to get us through this day. And so when these people are talking about college, like I'm thinking about how to make it through this day. And I think I walked out of there thinking that like underlying education is more than a lack of implementation. Underlying what keeps kids back is more than a lack of implementation. Like, yes, it is a lack of implementation, but it is also decades and decades of oppression. Right? Like that is the only thing that actually can reliably account for my hex circumstance. Like it is decades and decades and decades of oppression that have built up on one another. And so the purpose of school needs to be, how do you figure out how to undo those systems of oppression? Wow, that is so complex as well as so inspiring at the same time. First of all, more power to you for being able to address more such kids and providing platform to them. I want to take this conversation a little further because like you rightly mentioned, it's not just about implementing education anymore. You know, it's about even addressing and solving for oppression. So how do you think education can actually even start to address something like this in a 21st century we need to start by fundamentally questioning what we believe, right? And I think that starts by like, do we believe that kids from low income backgrounds can achieve at the same levels of kids from high income backgrounds? Do we believe that not just poverty doesn't have to equal destiny, but that poverty shouldn't and cannot equal destiny? And do we believe that it is our responsibility, regardless of whether kids they're our children or they're somebody else's children to ensure that all kids in this country succeed because the future of the country rests in the balance. Are we willing to equip our schools and our educational systems with the resources needed to be able to help kids climb out of poverty? And the third is that like, we need to ask ourselves like, do we value our future enough to where like our everyday common person, you and me, feel empowered enough and feel driven enough to not just talk about it, but to do something about it. Right now, the truth of the matter is, by and large, young people across the country are choosing every field but education. Like that is the truth. The truth is that young people don't wake up in this country and say like, hey, like I wanna go and teach. Young people don't wake up in this country and say like, hey, like I want to go and change the way that education works. And until we change that equation, until we actually get it so that it is aspirational to change the lives of others, like we're going to be stuck in this rut for a long time. The fourth thing is that like, we need to go back to design. Like we need to actually question like, who were our schools designed for? And what were they designed for? And what era of time were they designed for? And we need to start redesigning. And I say all of those because they go together. Like design alone will not solve this. Belief alone will not solve this. Resources alone will not solve this. People standing up to act alone will not solve this. It's when you put the four of those together that I think you can make magic happen. Hi, thank you for watching that. There is so much to talk about when we look at designing for education. This is just the beginning and the part one of this podcast. Tune in to the next one and listen to the rest of the conversation.